So hello everybody, welcome to today's ARI Double Seminar. My name's Fern Hames, I'm the Director of the Arthur Ryler Institute for Environmental Research in Delft. And today we're back into our 2022 seminars. We've had a bit of a break over the summer and here we are back with two terrific seminars today about genetics and the role that it might be able to play in wildlife conservation. Before we get into it, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm joining you today. I'm on Wurundjeri country. I pay my respects to elders past and present and any emerging leaders and wish to acknowledge any Aboriginal people, First Nations people that we have in the audience today and for all of the different countries on which you're all joining us from today. One of the beauties of Doing this online, we can have people from right across the state and indeed around the world jumping in and joining these seminars. Today we have a pair of seminars, as I said, they're both about genetics and the role in wildlife conservation. We have Lauren White, who's one of our new recruits at ARI. Very excited to have Lauren join us and I'm really looking forward to this talk today. Um, there's a lot of exciting things in this, so thank you so much for Lauren joining us today. And we also have Tiffany Cost joining us from Melbourne Uni, going to talk about well, what about chytrid and frogs? Can genetics help us there? So without any more from me, let's jump straight into it and hear from Lauren about genetic assessments of inbreeding in the wild. Thanks, Lauren. Go for it. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Fern. Uh, so as Fern said, the purpose of this talk today is to introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I'm a new recruit at the Arthur Ryler Institute, where I'll be working as a molecular ecologist. And so today I will be giving you a rundown of my research background and then talk very briefly about what I'll be doing at the ARI. My research has focused on using genetic data and genetic tools to answer a variety of questions about wildlife, ecology and biology. And I've been very lucky to work on a range of different species, but today I'll just be focusing on two projects, one on betongs and bandicoots and the second on wild chimpanzees. Now, these two projects are very different, but the unifying theme that I'm going for is inbreeding. Uh, I'm going to define inbreeding as a situation in which an individual's two genome copies um, have a significant proportion that is identical by descent. That's it's been inherited from a recent common ancestor. This can occur when an individual's parents are really closely related, like in this stylized example, but it can also happen when more distant relatives are mating uh, over successive generations, and so the inbreeding is building up, and this often happens in small populations or when populations go through a bottleneck. We care about inbreeding because it is it is, it usually, it's usually bad. It leads to negative fitness outcomes as exemplified by the Habsburg dynasty, which is, was very inbred and now extinct. And so it's often of interest to conservationists and managers of threatened species. But it also has really interesting implications for broader evolutionary theory. So the two projects I'll talk about today cover both these aspects, conservation and evolutionary biology. Let's start with inbreeding in a conservation context, uh, more specifically the genetics of reintroduction at Arid Recovery Reserve. Arid Recovery is a conservation reserve in arid South Australia near Roxby Downs. It's surrounded by a feral proof floppy topped fence which keeps out cats, foxes and rabbits. This has allowed the reintroduction of five different native mammal species so far. But today I'm just going to talk about the burrowing betongs or booties and the shark bay bandicoots. Now, reintroduction or translocation programs often involve a bottleneck when founders are removed from one source and released at the reintroduction site. And reintroduced populations are often small and isolated, at least at the beginning of these programs. And so inbreeding and genetic diversity are common concerns for uh, within these programs. So when I took on this project as part of my PhD, we wanted to examine the genetic changes that had occurred since translocation at Arid Recovery. We also wanted to try and identify any factors or characteristics that had led to those changes 
so that future translocation programs could be improved upon. On this slide, it's just a brief rundown of the uh, translocation history of betongs and bandicoots at Arid Recovery. There's a few things I want you to take away from here, uh, this table. Firstly, that the number of founders for both species that were released was kind of small, 30 and 17. And in both cases, uh, these founders came from two different islands. Doro Island and Bernier Island are both small islands in uh, Shark Bay, Western Australia. And while the Betong releases, there was two, were really close together within a year, and the population growth was really rapid, the Bandicoot releases occurred nine years apart, and their population growth was more modest. To generate data for this project, I used tissue samples that had been collected from almost all the founders at the time of release and stored at SA Museum. We also uh, trapped the descendant population in 2014 to collect ear clips. And using these samples, um, after I extracted the DNA, we used a RAD sequencing approach to generate one to 3,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms, that's SNP markers. And I use that data in a variety of different ways to look at genetic changes at our recovery, but um, for brevity and to keep on theme, I'll just be focusing on inbreeding today. So on these plots, the inbreeding coefficient is on the y-axis um, and positive values indicate that an individual is more inbred than we expect by chance, and negative values indicate that they are less inbred or more outbred than we expect by chance. We start with the Betong founders, they were significantly inbred. And we expected this because the island populations have probably been small and isolated for quite some time. But pleasingly, the arid recovery betongs were significantly less inbred than their founders. And in fact, on average, they weren't particularly different from zero. For the bandicoots, again, we see that the founders were pretty inbred. But the arid recovery bandicoots give a more complex picture. We've got most of the individuals that are slightly more inbred than their founders. Then we've got this really long tail, which ends with four individuals that were very significantly outbred. To understand what was going on, we next did some ancestry um, analyses using our genetic data. So on these plots, each bar represents an individual and the colors represent our estimate of the proportion of their genome that they inherited from a hypothesized ancestral population. So again, starting with the Betong founders, you can see that the two islands have mostly different ancestry, so it's the blue and the red. We can interpret this as divergence between the two islands, meaning that there probably hasn't been very much gene flow between those two islands, at least in the recent past. The arid recovery Betongs, they are this reasonably even mixture of their two founding groups. And we expected this because the founding groups were released within a year of each other and they've had 15 years to mix at arid recovery. For the bandicoots, again, we see that there is divergence between the two islands. But across arid recovery, very few individuals have received any ancestry from Doro Island. And in fact, these individuals that have red in their bars, that represents that long tail in our inbreeding results. And we think this is probably because that second group of founders was released nine years later after the first release and only four years before our sampling took place. And so those four individuals that you can see in this plot with the most Doro Island in, uh, ancestry, they represent the four individuals that were very outbred in our inbreeding results. And in fact, we think that these individuals are first generation hybrids. Over time, we expect that Doro Island ancestry to homogenize in the population, but we do need repeat sampling to, to determine if that's happened. So what we conclude from these results is that there has been a reduction in inbreeding for the arid recovery betongs and some of the arid recovery bandicoots. These positive gains have been driven by the admixture, the mixing of two inbred, but diverged source populations. This adds to a growing body of evidence that admixture, like mixing of two different source populations, can be used 
effectively in conservation programs to drive positive genetic changes. As in all science, there is ongoing work at Arid Recovery. In particular, we're really interested in asking whether the positive genetic outcomes that we've measured here actually translated into positive fitness outcomes. And that's really what we're trying to do by reducing inbreeding. All right, now for a graceful, a seamless transition into my second project, where I'll talk more about evolutionary outcomes of inbreeding, and in particular, inbreeding avoidance in wild chimpanzees. So as we said earlier, inbreeding usually leads to negative fitness outcomes. Uh, and so we often expect the evolution of inbreeding avoidance strategies like sex bias dispersal or active kin recognition and avoidance. But these types of behaviours aren't necessarily foregone conclusions. Um, in some circumstances, they might incur a cost like missed opportunity costs. And inclusive fitness theory actually predicts that inbreeding can be beneficial in some cases. And this is reflected in the literature um, where inbreeding avoidance behaviours in the wild, uh, there's mixed results across systems, across species, across studies. So inbreeding avoidance is particularly interesting in social species where uh, individuals are likely to encounter their opposite sex kin frequently. And, and dispersal, which should reduce inbreeding, it can be really costly because individuals are being removed from familiar surroundings, familiar resources, and the support of their family. My postdoc research is focused on chimpanzees, which are particularly interesting uh, subjects in the context of inbreeding avoidance, not only because they're highly social, but also because they're one of our closest living relatives and they re retain structures, behaviours, characteristics, which are assumed to be shared with ancestral humans. And so understanding them can help us understand our own evolutionary history. For example, uh, humans and chimpanzees are in the very small subset of social mammals in which females, rather than males, predominantly disperse from the community in which they are born. Uh, this sort of sex bias dispersal system is often hypothesized to be an inbreeding avoidance mechanism. And secondly, uh, breeding between close maternal relatives like mother, son and maternal siblings is very rarely observed in chimpanzees and indeed across most primates. And this is, uh, this hints at a familiarity based kin recognition system and it's hypothesized to have common evolutionary origins with human incest taboos. But neither of these processes have been quantitatively shown to reduce inbreeding in wild chimpanzees. And so for part of my postdoc project, I wanted to use genetic and behavioral data to answer a couple of questions. Firstly, does going through the costly process of dispersing actually lower a female's inbreeding risk? Is there a benefit to this costly um, behavior? And secondly, is there inbreeding avoidance or evidence for inbreeding avoidance within a community, which might suggest that there is some form of kin recognition going on? My study site was the Ngogo uh, chimpanzee community in Uganda. It's a, a long-term study site, which has been studied very intensively for almost 20 years. And it's a really interesting community because it's very large. There's about 150 individuals in the community at the moment. And also a fairly large proportion of females at Ngogo remain in the community in which they were born to breed. And so potentially inbreeding risk could be very high. Fortunately for me, since the program began at Ngogo, fecal samples have been collected almost continuously. These have been used very effectively since the late 90s as a genetic data source for individual identity and paternity tests using microsatellite markers. Now, while microsatellite markers and other amplicon based markers are fantastic tools for those types of analyses, um, what we wanted was genetic data that was more representative of the entire genome, and so we could get more accurate estimates of pairwise relatedness. What we wanted was genome-wide SNPs. But this type of data is really difficult to extract from feces. Um, this is because DNA extracted from feces is 
often very fragmented. And it's also from a mix of sources, including the subject, that's the chimpanzee that I'm interested in, but also lots of diet related DNA and a huge amount of microbiota. I screened over 2000 fecal extracts, and as you can see, the vast majority of DNA in these extracts was not from chimpanzees. And so if I sequenced these fecal extracts just as they were, the vast majority of fragments that were returned to me would be from organisms other than the chimpanzee that I'm actually interested in. And so this would be just a huge waste of resources. To overcome this, I spent the first part of my postdoc optimizing a hybridization capture uh, method. This aims to increase the proportion of target DNA in the extract um, before sequencing. And this approach uses modified RNA baits that are complementary to the target region. So uh, in my case, that's the exome, the coding region of the DNA. We bind these baits to the target region. Their modification then allows them to be immobilized on uh, a magnet so we can wash away the non-target DNA. Using this method, I was able to genotype around 200,000 SNPs from 212 NGOGO individuals. And I used that data to estimate genetic relatedness between pairs of individuals. Um, this is an estimate of the proportion of two individuals' genomes that are shared due to recent common ancestry. So for example, everyone has 50% of their genome from their father, which means your genetic relatedness to your dad is 0.5. This is the data I use to model inbreeding avoidance. Um, there's a lot going on in this plot, so bear with me. We've got genetic relatedness on the y-axis, and then each point is a male-female pair. Some of the colors represent uh, pairs for which we knew their pedigree relationship from the microsatellite pedigree and behavioral data. We've got some parent offsprings, there's half siblings, and a few half avuncular. That's the um, gender neutral term for aunt, uncle, niece, nephew. Uh, but you'll see that most of the pairs on this plot have unknown relationships. It's because the pedigree is very incomplete. Now we're comparing actual parents, so parents of offspring in the community, to potential parents. And potential parents are each mother in the data set paired with all the other adult males in the community at the time that she conceived her offspring. So these groups, this group represents the expected relatedness of parent pairs if mating was completely random. We also split the data set by whether the female was born in Ngogo, whether she's natal, or whether she immigrated in, because we have different expectations for these different groups to be able to recognize their male kin. And so I use this data to model genetic relatedness as a function of the natality status, natal or immigrant, and the parental status. I'll present these results on these density plots where genetic relatedness is on the x-axis, average genetic relatedness, and the shaded area is going to represent the posterior distribution. I'll start with looking at the results for potential parents, remembering that this represents um, what we expect under random mating, and so it gives a sense of inbreeding risk. So the first thing we found was that Natal females were more related to the pool of males in the community, that's uh, in orange here, than immigrant females were in blue. So there's, this shows that there is a significant benefit of dispersing. It significantly lowers your inbreeding risk. But given this first result, it was particularly interesting to me that when we looked at the relatedness of actual parent pairs, we find no difference between natal and immigrant females. They are equally related to the size of their offspring. And to better understand what's going on here, we can look at these results in a slightly different way. So we look just at the natal females. Again, genetic relatedness is on the x-axis. Here we can see that they are effectively avoiding breeding with their relatives. Uh, their relatedness to the pool of males, what we expect if mating was completely random, is here in green. And their relatedness to the size of their offspring is here in purple, it's significantly lower. For immigrant females, however, we find negligible evidence that they're avoiding inbreeding. Those two point estimates, like actual parent pairs, is a little bit lower than the potential parent pairs, 
there's a lot of overlap in those posterior distributions. And we think this is because they have so few male relatives in the community to avoid to begin with. Dispersal has already effectively lowered their inbreeding risk. All right, so I generated a lot of data and I used that in a reasonably simple model to answer the questions that I posed. We found that yes, dispersal effectively lowers inbreeding risk, uh, showing that it, it is a effective inbreeding avoidance mechanism. We also found that non-dispersing females are also able to avoid breeding with their relatives, which suggests that they are able to recognize their male relatives in the community somehow. Ongoing work at Ingogo is looking at how they might be recognizing their relatives. Um, top of the list of hypotheses is a familiarity-based mechanism where they avoid the males that they grew up with because they're more likely to have to be their, uh, their father or their brother, for example. Um, but phenotype matching through olfactory or visual cues is also a possibility. All right, so that's the bulk of my talk today. Um, I hope I've convinced you that assessing inbreeding in wild populations is, is interesting for more than one reason. But before I go, I just want to very briefly talk about four different projects that I'll be working on at my new role or within my new role at the ARI. So firstly, I'll be working on population and landscape genetics of feral pig and feral deer. Within these projects, we're hoping to contribute to population size estimates and also characterize population structure and gene flow uh, so that we can designate management units and ultimately improve control programs. And secondly, I'll be working on two different pilot projects involving environmental DNA. In the first of these, we'll be comparing camera trap data to DNA metabarcoding data from water samples to assess how well it will work for an all mammal survey. And in the second and the final project, I'll be testing whether we can use DNA extracted from soil to help identify active coal latrine sites. Hey, thank you very much for listening to me today. Uh, more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Fantastic, Lauren. That was so wonderful and intriguing and so many stories in there and I find it quite exciting. And of course, all this genetics work is just a rapidly evolving field for us in how we can better manage wildlife in terms of both pesky introduced things and the things that we really care about as well. So thank you. It's um, it's quite inspiring. I'm going to throw to Andy. I think we might have at least one question in the chat and I'd encourage our audience um, you know, I've just been sitting there watching and listening and not thinking about questions, but now that we're pausing a little, um, type any questions that you have into the chat. We'll see if we've got time for Lauren to answer them and there may be another chance at, at the end after Tiffany's talk as well to come back to some of those questions. But Andy, questions for Lauren? Yes, you're right, Fern. We do have one question ready, so everyone else please put them in. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, Lauren, would you be able to elaborate a bit about the outbreeding you saw with the bandicoot study you did? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we assume that those four individuals were first generation hybrids. And so that significant outbreeding is something you see when you've, they're very highly heterozygous compared to the rest of the sample. And that's because you've got these two inbred populations where everyone is very, very similar, but they're different from each other and then you mix them. So you end up with this situation where you've almost got two genome copies from two different sources. And that's what's driving that outbreeding result in the inbreeding analyses. Awesome, yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> um, I actually have a question around the method you used with the faecal uh, stuff with the gorillas. And you said that a lot of the DNA wasn't actually gorilla or chimpanzee um, DNA that you're hoping to look at. You're, you're looking at quolls now with soil DNA. How much of that do you think is going to be quoll and what are you going to use to resolve the same problem, I guess? Yeah, it's a very similar problem. 
probably very, very little will be quo. That's sort of what we expect. There's a lot going on in soil, as I'm sure lots of ecologists know. Um, so we'll be using slightly different methods for the, the soil because we're less, to begin with, at the very least, we're, we're mostly interested in testing whether the quolls have been there. So we don't necessarily need this huge amount of data to estimate relatedness. We just want to know if they're there or not. And so we'll be using an Amplicon and PCR-based uh, test. So it's like a yes, no answer. Um, but, you know, it's a pilot study. So if we do find that we can pick them up, then I think there's scope to apply the hybridization capture or something similar to really dig into quo genetics. We'll see. It's the point of a pilot. <laughs> very good. I look forward to it. I'm sure you're going to get some very interesting stuff out of it. Um, I've got a question here around the breeding cycles of bandicoots and betongs. Is this maybe re um, resulting in the differences in outbreeding that you saw? Possibly. Um, outbreeding results. Yeah. So maybe I think the the um, the question might be asking, we, we didn't see quite as much outbreeding with one of the species. Mm -hmm. Would this have been related to the, um, yeah, the, the breeding cycles? Do they breeding breed at cycles? different rates or more slowly? Yeah. Or something? I think it's mostly about the release time. I mean, their breeding cycles aren't hugely different, but just the fact that the betongs have had 15 years to sort of homogenize, I think is the main thing that's driving this difference. Whereas the bandicoots, the second release only happened four years before our sampling. And so it hasn't sort of even out and that gets reflected. These inbreeding um, measures as well are very relative, sort of relative to the rest of the sample. These guys are way more outbred. Um, so over time, we might see them um, being yeah, a bit more similar. Over time, I think that that years. sort of um, disappear, but, and, and it will end up looking a bit more like the betongs where it sort of hovers around zero. That's the hope. Yeah, cool. Thanks very much. Um, and I've got one last question. Uh, it's asking what, under what circumstances will the mammal DNA get into the water? And most species don't need to drink it, drink surface water don't need to drink at surface water bodies. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a really good point. Um, we expect DNA to get into water bodies through drainage. So if uh, animals are defecating on soily sections, rocky sections, and then the water's um, draining into a bigger water body. That's the main way, I think, because as you say, most of them aren't actually drinking directly from the water and there will probably be differences in the rate that we pick up DNA from particular species based on various behaviors and I think I've got some arboreal species in that picture there. I'm not sure what our chances of picking those up are but we're gonna see. You won't know unless you give it a go hey. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much Lauren for answering those questions and thank you to everyone who asked them. Uh, I'm gonna throw back to Fern to introduce our next presenter. Thanks, Andy, and thanks, Lauren, and thanks to all the questioners. It keeps our conversation rich and interesting and keeps us asking questions all along the way. So I'd like to now introduce Tiffany Koch. She's coming to us from University of Melbourne and going to talk about the relevance of genetics here in helping us what might be happening with chytrid in frogs. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Fern. Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the potential of using genetic intervention approaches to restore amphibians threatened by chytridiomycosis. Chytridiomycosis is a skin disease of amphibians that is caused by the fungal pathogen Botrachochytrium dendrobatidis, hereafter referred to as BD. This disease is the worst infectious disease ever recorded in vertebrates. BD threatens over 500 species worldwide and has caused about 100 extinctions. This is a photograph from a mass frog die-off from chytridiomycosis in Sierra Nevada, California. BD was first described in 1998 after frog die-offs in Australia and Central America. 
Subsequently, it has been found worldwide. It is very difficult to eradicate because it has a wide host range and amphibian hosts vary considerably in susceptibility. In Australia, evidence suggests that BD was introduced around 1978 near the port of Brisbane. It then subsequently spread up and down the East Coast. Since its introduction into Australia, BD has driven six species to extinction, including the southern gastric brooding frog. Seven other species are at high risk of extinction and require intervention to continue to persist. Many methods have been tested in attempt to eradicate BD from the wild with varying degrees of success. Although some are effective at controlling the fungus, most require repeated application to remain effective and are fraught with off-target effects. So far, conservation breeding is the only effective approach for preventing extinction from BD. There are currently about 200 amphibians dependent upon this approach, approach worldwide. Many of these pro uh, programs also involve reintroduction. However, most reintroduction efforts fail since susceptible amphibians are released into habitats where the fungus is still present. This occurs because breeding programs manage species in a way to freeze their genetic characteristics, thus preserving their susceptibility to the BD pathogen. The other downside to conservation breeding is that it does not address the loss of ecosystem functions arising from the absence of species in an ecosystem. We have developed a method that attempts to circumvent many of the challenges I just mentioned. Targeted genetic intervention, or TGI, is a toolbox of methods that promote heritable changes that are passed on to offspring. It increases the ability of a population to persist with threats like BD by changing the incidence of alleles that impact on fitness. These methods can be applied to both hosts and symbionts. TGI approaches vary in how they promote genetic change. Synthetic biology approaches modify genetic features by genetic engineering. Artificial selection induces genetic change by selective breeding. And genetic, genetic rescue works by facilitating immigration between populations with desirable features. Today, I will be talking about testing the application of the two tools marked with an asterisk in frogs threatened by BD. To date, genetic rescue is the only TGI approach approved for species restoration, where it has been used to restore species such as Florida panthers, Tasmanian devils, and northern quolls. The closest species for release in the wild modified by synthetic biology is the American chestnut tree. These trees have been genetically engineered for chestnut blight resistance, and trial restoration plannings are expected to begin soon, pending regulatory approval. TGI using synthetic biology is currently under development in other species, including corals and black-footed ferrets. Starting this year, we are going to evaluate TGI in southern corroboree frogs. This frog is an alpine species that is endemic to Mount Kosciuszko National Park in New South Wales. It was driven to functional extinction in the wild by BD. Luckily, extinction was prevented by intervention of species, by the intervention of species managers and zoos who established a conservation breeding program. Although successful at preventing extinction, this program has not been successful at restoring this species to the wild as the fungus remains in the environment. Our project will use a stepwise approach, approach for assessing TGI. This is a long-term project with many safety checks built in that will take many years to complete. It will also require long-term monitoring to ensure effectiveness. If successful, we believe this can be used as a proof of concept for restoring other BD threatened our other BD threatened amphibians to the wild. Next, I'll briefly discuss this plan. Since TGI is a genetic ap approach, it requires that adaptive traits like BD resistance have a genetic basis and are heritable. In a pilot study, we showed that corroboree frogs have phenotypic variation at the individual and population level 
in survival and resistance after infection with the BD pathogen, suggesting there is a heritable component to resistance in this species. The figure on the left shows population differences in survival, with the green population having the highest survival. The figure on the right shows infection load through time and suggests that some individuals in the green population were able to limit and eventually clear BD infection. Since we have some evidence of a genetic basis for BD resistance, we're interested in understanding what genes are involved so that we can target them with TGI. We will address this using a genome-wide association study approach. This will consist of a laboratory pathogen study using 1,000 frogs from 30 different families. We will then measure various traits in the infected frogs, including pathogen load and survival. The genome-wide association study will be performed by PhD candidate Michaela Davidson, who will use this approach to characterize the genetic architecture of BD resistance. Genetic architecture is how many genes impact a trait and their effect size. Understanding genetic architecture is critical to performing TGI as this will determine the best TGI approach. Here we see two Manhattan plots of traits with different genetic architectures. These plots have chromosome location on the x-axis and significance on the y-axis. The trait in the top plot is controlled by just three genes, whereas the one on the bottom is impacted by many. If BD resistance is a simple, has a simple genetic architecture, like the trait on the top, then synthetic biology approaches may be best as they excel at modifying just a few genes. Whereas if it has a complex genetic architecture, like the trait on the bottom, then artificial selection may be more ideal as these approaches are better at modifying many genes. Once the genetic architecture of BD resistance is known, we will trial the approaches most likely to be successful. One of the approaches we're considering testing is an artificial selection approach commonly used for livestock known as genomic selection. Genomic selection works by using a training population, as I've indicated here, which is comprised of relatives of the potential breeding stock. The size of the training population should be at least 1,000 animals, but this can be adjusted depending on population structure. The training population will then be challenged by BD and measured for phenotypic response. Then the animals are genotyped for genome-wide variants and the effects of each genetic variant are estimated and used to create a prediction model. Now moving on to the candidate breeding stock, all animals in this population are genotyped and this information is incorporated, incorporated into the prediction model to calculate each animal's estimated breeding value or EBV. This is a prediction of the animal's phenotype from its composite genotype at genome-wide markers. From here, we can set up a breeding plan to maximize e EBVs and minimize unwanted characteristics such as inbreeding. We will also be developing synthetic biology approaches for corroborate frogs. The synthetic biology approaches that we're most interested in testing are transgenesis and gene editing. Transgenesis incorporates foreign DNA from a different species into the genome, whereas gene editing is more subtle and works by inducing the organism itself to knock out or replace targeted genes. These approaches have many appealing features for a conservation program, including speed, specificity, and low impact on genetic diversity. This means that major changes occur in the first generation rather than having to wait for several as an artificial selection. These methods can also be used to introduce novel genetic information or even restore lost alleles, meaning that resistance alleles can be swapped across populations or even species. Once we've performed TGI, we will screen the TGI frogs in the lab to evaluate if they have increased BD resistance. We will also screen frogs for off-target effects. For artificial selection methods, 
Since they are less targeted, we will compare phenotypes of TGI frogs to baseline phenotypes, including things like reproductive traits and behavior. Synthetic biology approaches sometimes induce mutations in off-target off regions. Therefore, we will screen the, the genomes of these frogs to ensure that this has not occurred. Once we've achieved the desired results in the lab, we will move on to, the, on to field trials where frogs will be released into exclosures to monitor fitness in natural conditions. Here we will evaluate how TGI frogs respond to natural stressors such as temperature shifts, drought, microbes, and interactions with competitors. After all of the previous steps, if the TGI approach has passed all of the checks for risk and efficacy, and we receive all the necessary regulatory approval and approval from all impacted entities, we will begin limited releases into the wild and monitor the release frogs for long-term survival. So you might be wondering how we plan to address all the potential controversy of performing these procedures. In addition to evaluating the efficacy and risks of TDI, one of the goals of our research program is to in increase discussion on public concerns and misunderstandings of these approaches. This is a planned component of our project once we've established the efficacy of these approaches in the lab and will involve discussion with all stakeholders, including the general public, indigenous peoples, and local communities. This will be an iterative process occurring throughout each stage of the research program. There is limited data on public perceptions on the use of TGI approaches for conservation. A recent public opinion survey by CSIRO on the possible use of synthetic biology for species conservation suggests that the majority of the Australian public are at least moderately supportive of this approach. Public perceptions on artificial selection approaches have not been evaluated, although such approaches are widely used in agriculture, so are less likely to be controversial. The main goal of our TGI research program is to evaluate the value of this approach for conservation. We are also interested in discussing the development of best practices for TGI with other scientists, land managers, and conservation practitioners like many of you here today. Although we will, we will evaluate TGI in controlled settings, whether or not it is ever used for species restoration is not the decision of scientists like myself, but rather that of society. I plan to provide evidence on the efficacy and risk of these approaches to allow society to make an informed choice about the value of TGI. In summary, TGI has many potential advantages over traditional conservation approaches. It allows species to survive in the wild in the presence of intractable threats like BD without continued intervention. And most importantly, because this approach restores species to the wild, it restores their critical ecosystem services. TGI differs from traditional conservation breeding by focusing on promoting adaptation rather than preserving adaptive potential. These methods create highly adaptive species by promoting genetic change. Due to the potential loss of adaptive potential from TGI, it should be performed with caution. TGI also requires investment in genomic resources to understand the genetic underpinnings of adaptive traits. This is necessary to ensure that intervention methods are effective and also to ensure that they are targeted to minimize unintended impacts. Lastly, consideration should be given from the project onset to regulatory requirements and public perceptions to ensure that TGI modified species will be allowed to be released. Genetic intervention as a conservation tool is rapidly gaining momentum, as indicated by the six books published on this last year alone. Traditional conservation approaches have not been successful at restoring amphibians threatened by chytridiomycosis. TGI is a promising solution to allow amphibians to survive with the disease. We plan to evaluate this approach, but will proceed with caution to ensure safety and public acceptance.
Before I move on to my acknowledgments, I'd like to advertise um, that we have two PhD positions in my research group at the University of Melbourne. Uh, one focusing on frog genomics and TGI, and the other on BD fungus genetics and RNAi. The deadline for application is the 31st of March. Please contact me for more information. Thank you everyone for listening to my talk. Um, I'd like to conclude by thanking the members of my research group and other collaborators who are helping me to adapt TGI approaches to help conserve amphibians. We are especially grateful for the teams at Zoos Victoria and Taronga Conservation Society for their support and for providing the frogs we will be using in our experiments. And lastly, I'd like to thank the Arthur Ryla Institute for the opportunity to present my research to you today. And from there, I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Wow, that was terrific. And I'm really looking forward to the conversations that are going to happen now between academics, between policy, between the communities, between First Nations people, the rich conversations that we can have about the opportunities here and how we should progress. These are multi-dimensional conversations that we need to have. So terrific way of framing them and suggesting them to us. And a very clever move to advertise your PhD for the <laughs> well, Go for it, people, if you're interested in this contact, Tiffany. Um, I think we do have a couple of questions, Andy. How are we going? Yep, we certainly do. Um, the first question I think Tiffany you answered in the some of the final slides of your presentation, but um, it's around the losing desirable traits when you're doing artificial selection of frogs. So are there any techniques or ways to work around this so we can ensure that while they are doing these lab setting wild fitness, we're not losing those really important traits? Yeah, so the best way to do this is to have a method for preserving genetic diversity. So the more targeted approaches like synthetic biology, you're only going to be modifying the genes that of interest. Whereas if you use an approach like artificial selection, you're, you may have more modifications because it's less targeted. Um, programs like the American chestnut tree, they actually have transgenic trees, but then they're back crossing them to wild populations to try to increase genetic diversity. But this is always a problem. And in fact, this is seen in species like humans. Um, there's a mutation called CCR5 delta, which makes humans resistant to AIDS virus. Um, however, if you're fixed for this mutation, you're actually more susceptible to diseases like influenza and yellow fever, sorry, um, West Nile virus. Um, so yeah, this is a potential problem because the actual strategy of this approach is to fix alleles that are advantageous. And so we don't necessarily know what the consequences of this may be. It may make the frogs really resistant to chytrid, but possibly susceptible to something else in the environment. So this is one of the things that we're hoping to evaluate um, by releasing the frogs into these exclosures and then possibly limited releases into the wild. But it will have to be carefully evaluated through time, which is one of the reasons why I tried to stress that long-term monitoring is really key to one of these projects being safe and also effective. Great answer. Thank you very much, Tiff. Yeah. Um, I think you almost answered the next question around what are the real world examples that TGI is being successfully applied with your chestnut example. But do you have any other ones that you think we can learn from? Yeah, so um, I, I, I mentioned this just a little bit in my talk, um, but really it's a very untried method. The only thing that's been tried up to this point as far as releases is genetic rescue, um, which, is, which is quite a bit of a different approach than the more dramatic methods that I focused on in my talk, like synthetic biology and artificial selection. Um, genetic rescue has been used very successfully in species like the Florida panther and has also been used to some degree in species like Tasmanian devils and quolls. Um, there are several species that synthetic biology approaches are being developed in, in addition to the American chestnut. So there's various researchers working, especially on corals, to increase their thermal tolerance and allow them to survive with climate change. Um, and so um, a couple papers have come out in the last um, couple of years showing um, efficacy for this possibility. But it will probably be quite a long time before these corals would be released in the wild. 
Um, in the United States, um, several synthetic biology methods are being um, tried on the endangered black-footed ferret. So this species got down to about 17 individuals and there's an extensive captive breeding program. But because it got down to such a small number of animals, there's very limited genetic diversity and they're very susceptible to diseases like plague. So they're actually considering several synthetic biology approaches and in fact, it was quite big news um, last year where they actually cloned um, one of these animals to help um, with genetic rescue for increasing genetic diversity. So it's definitely being considered, but all of this stuff um, is, is not very close to release at this time. Thank you very much. Um, really good answer. Lots of good examples, as you just said. Um, <laughs> A question around, you mentioned there was about a thousand individuals needed for one of the selection processes you're talking about. How many corroboree frogs do we have and how many more would we need to try that approach? Yeah, so um, the reason for the thousand animals is you need a really well-powered study. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the genetic architecture of the trait. So we don't know anything about it at this point. So that's why I'm saying a thousand animals. If it's a a simple trait, then um, you can get by with less animals, but, but at this point we don't know. Um, but luckily for us, we've been working closely with our zoo partners to design this study, and they're actually breeding up the thousand animals that we'll be using for this genome-wide association study. So um, most of these animals are usually released into the wild every year. Um, the, the zoos produced a couple thousand um, corroboree frogs every year and release them into the wild. And so we'll actually be taking the animals that would normally be released. So this, this will be impacting the reintroduction efforts. But the way the, the zoos see it from how I understand it is they know that at least at this point, most of these frogs that are released into the wild don't seem to be surviving. So they're gonna let us use the animals from a couple breeding seasons to see if we can find a way to allow them to survive. So we're very appreciative of them for, for helping us out with this. Great, it's really good to hear. Um, really interesting behind the scenes stuff. Um, yeah. I've got a question around climate change. So given that the impacts of climate change, uh, are we considering other species other than the corroboree frog as a major focus for this type of genetic work? Yeah, so our group isn't, but um, especially for trees and a lot of plants, this is being considered. And as I mentioned already, corals. Um, so they're actually trying to, to to develop species that can survive at higher temperatures, um, higher salt concentrations, more variable climates, all of these different things. And a lot of these approaches are already used widely in agriculture for a lot of the think the foods that we eat. So it's definitely plausible that it can be done. Awesome. Um, and I guess in the same regard, um, you working out how this sort of technique would work for corroboree frogs and when you find out which one's best, is that going to be able to be applied to promote chytrid resistance and other species of frog? Yeah, that's what we're hoping, Andrew. Um, we don't know, um, you know, whether or not resistance in corroboree frogs is going to be the same in the green and gold bell frog. But one of the things that we're hoping to do early on is once we've established some efficacy in corroboree frogs, we're going to start trialing some other Australian species to see if it's the same genes or if the same methods might work. And then we're hoping eventually that this might be used as a proof of concept for this approach for not only frogs threatened by chytrid, but also, as you mentioned, other threatened species around the globe. Amazing. Um so we're out of questions in the chat, but I'm going to ask one more last one. Uh, so you're telling me that by 2030, I could be hopeful that maybe this disaster and nightmare of chytrid is going to be long forgotten and we're going to have all our happy frogs uh, living in a chytrid free world. I certainly hope so, Andrew. Uh, that might be a bit ambitious. It might be more like 2040, but uh, I'll try my best to make it happen. <laughs> Look, I'll take 2040. That's not bad at all. OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're out of questions from the audience, so thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to throw back to Fern to close today's session. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Tiffany. And thanks, Lauren. And there's definitely things to look forward to as we get to learn more and learn how we can apply some of these things as well. It gives us great hope for the world ahead. So thank you so much. Thank you for your presentations today. Thank you to everybody who joined in and was part of our seminar presentations today in the chat and with conversations, with questions.
look out for the email from Andy with the recording link if you would like to share it with somebody else. I'm really grateful that you could join us today. Our next seminar is in exactly a month's time on the 21st of March when we're hearing from two ARI speakers, Rachel Leahy and Jos Moore. And um, I think Andy will, will send you an email with their talk topics and we hope to see you then. So thanks again, Andy. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Tiff. Thanks, everybody, for coming along. Have a great week and keep well. See you again soon. Bye.